Chapter 30 On Parole Quite extra that one. Parole We're back in the stockade I was wakened Indeed we were all wakened For I could see even the sentinel shake himself together From where he had fallen against the doorpost By a clear hearty voice Hailing us from the margin of the wood Blockhouse ahoy, it cried. Here's the doctor. And the doctor it was. Dr. Livesey, of course, not the doctor. Wheel. Although I was glad to hear the sound, yet my gladness was not without admixture. I remembered. I remembered. With confusion. My insubordinate and stealthy conduct. And when I saw where it had brought me, among what companions and surrounded by what dangers... I felt ashamed to look him in the face. Yeah, because remember, Long John was like, I tell you what though, Jim, when the doctor and everybody came round, you know what the doctor said? He said, that Jim Hawkins is a knobhead. If, I, if he ever came back, you know what I'd do? I'd put him in one of them cannons and fill that cannon with custard like some sort of 90s game show and I'd fire him out of it into the sea. That's what I think of you and you may later that. That's what Silver said, wasn't it? The, 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 the general gist. Of what he said. He must have risen in the dark, for the day had hardly come, and when I ran to a loophole and looked out, I saw him standing, like silver once before, up to the mid-leg in creeping vapour. You, doctor! Top of the morning to you, sir! cried silver, broad awake and beaming with good nature in a moment. Bright and early, to be sure, and it's the early bird, as the saying goes, that gets the rations. George, shake up your timber, son, and help Dr. Livesey over the ship's side. All are doing well, your patience was. All well and merry. So he patted on, standing on the hilltop with his crutch under his elbow, and one hand upon the side of the log house. Quite the old John, in manner and expression. We've got a, quite a surprise for you too, sir, he continued. We've a little stranger here. Hehe. <laughs> That's how it's written. A.G. A.G. <laughs> We've got a little stranger for you here. <laughs> a new boarder and lodger, sir, and looking fit and taut as a fiddle. Slept like a supercargo, he did, right alongside of John. Stern to stern we was all night. Dr. Livesey was by this time across the stockade and pretty near the cook, and I could hear the alteration in his voice as he said, Not Jim. The very same Jim as ever was says Silver. The doctor stopped outright, although he did not speak, and it was some seconds before he seemed able to move on. Well, well, he said at last. Duty first and pleasure afterwards, as you might have said yourself, Silver. Let us overhaul those patients of yours. A moment afterwards he had entered the blockhouse, and with one grim nod to me. So he'd come in like that. Doctor! He's like that. Proceeded with his work among the sick. He seemed under no apprehension, though he must have known that his life among these treacherous demons, good phrase, depended on a hair. One of the hairs on his lovely wig, no doubt. And he rattled on to his patients as if he were paying an ordinary professional visit in a quiet English family. His manner, I suppose, reacted on the men, for they behaved to him as if nothing had occurred as if he were still the ship's doctor, and they still faithful hands before the mast. "'You're doing well, my friend,' he said to the fellow with the bandaged head. "'Bandaged yed, sorry. I pronounce head as head, then, like some sort of southerner. "'The fellow with the bandaged yed. "'And if ever, if ever any person had a close shave, it was you. "'Your head must be hard as iron. "'Well, George, how goes it? "'You're a pretty colour, suddenly.' Why, your liver man is upside down. So it was to do with his liver, like we said, some sort of cirrhosis, some, some, some fever um, affected his liver for George Merry. You're a pretty colour, certainly. Why, your liver man is upside down. Did you take that medicine? Did you take the medicine, man? Aye, aye, sir, he took it, sure enough, returned Morgan. Because, you see, since I'm mutineer's doctor, or prison doctor, as I prefer to call it, says Dr. Livesey, in his pleasantest way. I make it a point of honour not to lose a man for King George, God bless him, and the gallows. Salty stuff from Dr. Livesey. 
The rogues looked at each other, but swallowed the home thrust in silence. Dick don't feel well, sir, said one. Don't you? replied the doctor. Well, step up here, Dick, and let me see your tongue. See Dick's tongue, eh? No, I should be surprised I should be surprised if he did. The men's tongue is fit to fight <laughs> The men's tongue is fit to frighten the French. Another fever. All right, said Morgan. That come to spoiling Bibles. That cummed, as you call it, of being arrant asses, retorted the doctor, and not having sense enough to know honest air from poison, and the dry land from a vile pestiferous slough. The doctor's absolutely banging dialogue by the doctor in this, this chapter. I think it most probable, though, of course it's only an opinion, that you'll all have the deuce to pay before you get that malaria out of your systems. Camp in a bug, would you? Silver, I'm surprised at you. You're less of a fool than many. Take you all round. But you don't appear to me to have the rudiments of a notion of the rules of health. So basically they've all been camped out in a giant bed of mosquitoes and swamp. Well, he added, after he doused them round and they had taken his prescriptions with really laughable humility. More like charity school children than blood-guilty mutineers and pirates. Well, that's done at a charity school, children, uh, I would assume, probably uh, people who went to uh, free schools or, or uh, you know, the, the grammar schools of the, um, of the 18th century, which would have been, you know, schools set up by benefactors for, for, for children of the town to uh, go to, um, you know, often, often children from, from poorer families brought up into the main town uh, to be educated at uh, a grammar school, a free school, a charity school. Um, in the middle of town, and you know, therefore, to go on and to socially progress, um, it was very complex. Very complex, the uh, educational system of the seventeenth, uh, eighteenth, um, and early uh, nineteenth century. Very, very, very different from uh, from you know, evolved into the modern system of, uh, of grammar schools and, and public schools. But uh, in those days, very, very different, uh, very different kettle of fish. Not the public schools, of course. They stayed the same. Um, been the same for six hundred years. Uh, I'm just going to angle the camera down because, to be honest, it looks like I've sunk. And I'm sure that's fine. It's not like I want to get more of me in, to be honest. But I'm aware that's a bit weird. Why is it being weird? Is it has the screen changed? No, I can't. I can't explain it, guys. I'm sorry about that. You're just going to have to see this much of me for now. I hope that's fine. I've, I've had a bath and everything, so. So these pirates, they're all having their, they're all having their cow pole, is the, is the upshot. Well, that's done for today. And now I should wish to have a talk with that boy, please. And he nodded his head in my direction carelessly. I'd like to have a talk with that boy, please. Okay. And he nodded his head in my direction carelessly. George Merry was at the door, spitting and spluttering over some bad tasted medicine. But at the first word of the doctor's proposal, he swung round with a deep flush and cried, No! And swore. Then what he said. No! Fuck it out! Silver struck the barrel with his open hand. Silence! He roared. And looked about him positively like a lion. Doctor, he went on in his usual tones. I was a-thinking of that, knowing as how you had a fancy for the boy. We're all humbly grateful for your kindness, and as you see, puts faith in you, and takes the drugs down like much, uh, and takes the drugs down like that much grog. And I take it I found a, a way as will suit all. Hawkins, will you give me your word of honour as a young gentleman? For a young gentleman you are, although poor born, your word of honour not to slip your cable. I readily gave the pledge required. Then, doctor," said Silver, "you just step outside that stockade." Once you're there, I'll bring the boy down on the inside, and I reckon you can yarn through the spars. Good day to you, sir, and all our duties to the squire and Captain Smollett. It's not Captain Smollett. Still alive? The explosion of disapproval, which nothing but Silver's black looks had restrained, broke out immediately. The doctor had left the house. 
Silva was roundly accused of playing double, of trying to make a separate peace for himself, of sacrificing the interests of his accomplices and victims, and, in one word, of the identical exact thing that he was doing. It seemed to me so obvious in this case that I could not imagine how he was to turn their anger, but he was twice the man the rest were, and his last night's victory had given him a huge preponderance on their minds. He called them all the fools and dolts you can imagine. You! What the fuck you think you're talking about? Don't you call you to listen to me, you fucking idiot! Who's the captain? You're barbecue forever! His last night's victory had given him a huge preponderance on their minds. He called them all the fools and dolts you can imagine. Said it was necessary I should talk to the doctor. Fluttered the chart in their faces, the treasure map. Yeah, Asked them if they could afford to break the treaty the very day they were bound to treasure hunting. No, by thunder, he cried. It's us must break the treaty when the time comes. Until then I'll gammon that doctor if I have to oil his boots with brandy. And then he bade them get the fire lit and stalked out upon his crutch with his hand on my shoulder, leaving them in a disarray and silenced by his volubility rather than convinced. Mm. I should read that as and silenced by his volu and silenced by his volubility rather than convinced. Slow, lad, slow, he said. They might round upon us in a twinkle of an eye if we were seen to hurry. Like that to the pirates. Don't make any sudden movements. All right, boys, just taking him over to the doctor. <laughs> Please don't let them hang me, Jim. Please. Very deliberately, then, did we advance across the sand to where the doctor waited us, awaited us on the other side of the stockade. And as soon as we were within easy speaking distance, Silver stopped. You'll make a note of this here also, doctor, says he. And the boy will tell you how I saved his life and would depose for it too, and you may lay to that, doctor. When a man's steering as near the wind as me, praying chuck farthing with the last breath in his body like you wouldn't think it too much, may have to give him one good word. You'll please bear in mind, it's not my life only now. It's that boy's into the bargain. And you'll speak me fair, doctor, and give me a bit of hope to go on for the sake of mercy. Silver was a changed man once he was out there and had his back to his friends in the blockhouse. His cheeks seemed to have fallen in. His voice trembled. Oh, please, Doctor, please. Never was a soul more dead in earnest. Why, John, you're not afraid? Asked Dr. Livesey. Doctor, I'm no coward, no. Not I, not so much. He snapped his fingers. If I was, I wouldn't say it. But I'll own up fairly, I have the shakes upon me for the gallows. You're a good man and a true. I never seen a better man. And you'll not forget what I done good, not any more than you'll forget the bad I know. And I step aside, see here, and leave you and Jim alone. And you'll put that down for me too, for it's a long stretch, is that? Yeah, he's absolutely pissing himself in fear of the, uh, of the gallows, isn't he, Long John? As well, you might. They hanged people left, right and centre back in those days, especially pirates. You could be hanged for anything. And a terrible way to execute somebody. Most oh, certainly. Enough to turn Long John against his own pirates. It's a long stretch, is that? The stretch of his. So saying, he stepped back a little way till he was out of earshot and there sat down upon a tree stump and began to whistle. What was he whistling, do we think? Do you think he was whistling the sea shanty from earlier? Spinning round now and again upon his seat. So as to command the sight of me and the doctor. I'm imagining him going round like a microwave. Hang on. I couldn't do the full 360, hang on. Thanks, Auto Zoom. How are you doing, Jimmy? You alright? Not too bad, thank you, Doc. What's he doing? talking about you get the general idea it's nice isn't it dynamism 
bit of kineticism. So, Long John's uh, rotating on the spot, like something out of The Exorcist. Auto zoom still hasn't found its way back, has it? I'm here, I'm here. So Sony stepped back a little way until he was out of earshot and there sat down upon a tree stump and began to whistle, spinning round now and again upon his seat. So as to, uh, thanks very much for his words. So as to command the sight, sometimes of me and the doctor, and sometimes of his unruly ruffians as they went to and fro in the sand between the fire, which they were busy rekindling, and the house from which they brought forth pork and bread to make the breakfast. Mmm. So, Jim, said the doctor, sadly. Pardon me, terrible hiccups. It's like Vim I've been drinking. So, Jim, said the doctor, sadly. Here you are. As you have brewed, so you shall drink, my boy. Heaven knows I cannot find it in my heart to blame you. But this much I will say, be it kind or unkind. When Captain Smallet was well, you dared not have gone off. And when he was ill and couldn't help it, by George, it was dying right cowardly. I was alone here that I began to weep. Doctor, I said, you might spare me. I've blamed myself enough, my life's forfeit anyway, and I should have been dead by now if Silver hadn't stood for me. And Doctor, believe this, I can die, and I dare say I deserve it, but what I fear is torture. If they come to torture me, Jim... The doctor interrupted and his voice was quite changed. Jim, I can't have this. Whip over and we'll run for it. Doctor, said I, I pass my word. I know, I know, he cried. We can't help that, Jim, now. I'll take it on my shoulders, hold us, ball us, bleem and shame, my boy. But stay here, I cannot let you. Jump, one jump on your right, and we'll run for it like interlopes. No, I replied. You know right well you wouldn't do the thing yourself. Neither you nor Squire nor Captain, and no more will I. Silver trusted me, and I pass my word, and back I go. But, Doctor, you did not let me finish. If they come to torture me, I might let slip a word of where the ship is. For I got the ship part by luck and part by risking, and she lies in North Inlet on the southern beach and just below high water. At half tide she must be high and dry. The ship! exclaimed the Doctor. Rapidly I described to him my adventures and he heard me out in silence. There is a kind of feat in this, he observed. Observed? He observed when I had done. Every step, it's you that saves our lives. And do you suppose by any chance that we're going to let you lose yours? That would be a poor return, my boy. You will find out the plot. You will find Ben Gunn. Best deed you ever did or will do, though you live to ninety. Oh, by Jupiter! And talking of Ben Gunn, why, this is the mischief in person! Silver! he cried. Silver, I'll give you a piece of advice, he continued, as the cook drew near again. Don't you be in any great hurry after that treasure. Why, sir, I do my possible, which that ain't, said Silver. I can only ask in your pardon, save my life and the boys by seeking for that treasure, and you may later that. Well, Silver, replied the doctor, if that is so, I'll go one step further. Look out for squalls when you find it. Sir, said Silver, as between man and man, that's too much and too little. What you're after... Why, you left the blockhouse. Why, you give me that there chart? I don't know, now do I? And yet I done your bidding with my eyes shut, and never a word of hope. But no. No. This is too much. If you won't tell me what you mean plain out, just say so, and I'll leave the helm. No, said the doctor musingly. I've no right to say more. It's not my secret, you see, Silver. Or I give you my word, I tell it to you. But I'll go as far with you as I dare go, and step beyond. For I'll have my wig sorted by the captain, or I'm mistaken. Oh, good to see Dr. Lifts his wig back in the mix. And first, I'll give you a bit of hope. Silver, if we both get alive out of this wolf trip, 
I'll do my best to save you, short of perjury. Silver's face was radiant. You couldn't say more, I'm sure, sir, not if you was my mother, he cried. Well, that's my first concession, added the doctor. My second is a piece of advice. Keep the boy close beside you, and when you need help, hello. That's him saying, you know, go, you know, hello for it, cry out for it. That's not him just going, and if you need help, hello, like he's just forgotten what was happening and who they are. And when you need help, I'll start that again. My second is a piece of advice. Keep the boy close beside you. And when you need help, hello. I'm after seeking for you. And that itself will show you if I speak at random. Goodbye, Jim. And Dr. Lipsy shook hands with me through the stockade, nodded to Silver, and set off at a brisk pace into the wood. End of chapter.